local and global, because what happens in Cincinnati and around the world deeply matters to us. to reaching the next generation and serving our community. Diversified and unified, we love to celebrate the richness of our diversity and the beauty of our unity. Relational and missional. We love that we get to be on mission serving Christ as family. Compassion and conviction. We're called to have compassion for God's people and conviction for God's word. There we go. Come on. All right. Um, but but we've been in a series in, in numbers entitled Words in the Wilderness. And we've been having a great time just learning, hopefully being challenged by that. But today we're going to take a break from that. I just want to um, speak a message that I felt specifically for today. And there was a song that was sung a little bit earlier, I Will Build My Life. It's called Build My Life. In the words of that song in the, in the bridge, it goes, I will build my life upon your word. It is a firm foundation. How many of you know that all of us are building our lives on some type of foundation? The question is not whether we're building our lives on a foundation. The question is whether or not the foundation that we're building our lives on is able to hold us up when we need to be held up. Is it strong enough to last? And, and one of the things that it made me think about is a phenomenon that lasted about two weeks on social media. It was called the Crate Challenge. Anybody ever heard of the Crate Challenge before? So, so let me just, I'm not, you know, it crossed my mind to demonstrate this, but then I was like, I like my life, You're, you know. So I decided not to. But uh, this is, you know, you have these milk crates. So here's what people would do. Uh, they would set a bunch of these milk crates up and the goal was for them to walk all the way across. You guys seen that when they walk all the way across? Few people make it. A lot of people don't. So just in case you're like, what in the world is this whole crate challenge thing that he's talking about? Instead of demonstrating this, we figured we'll just show you a video of other people who are crazy enough to do it. So turn your attention to the screens for a moment. Why jump? Oh. All right. 
Now, I, I, I have to say this. We had, in my preparation, we had people who were actually willing to say, hey, I'll do this live if you want to. But then I thought, I was like, every nation in Cincinnati will not be held liable for any <laughs> craziness of anybody. But you, you look at it, and here's what happens, right? It, it, first of all, it's painful to look at. Secondly, do not try this at home, kids. We are not promoting this. But what, or, or adults. <laughs> Some of y'all know you ain't got no business. But, but here's what happens, right? People start off really strong. They start off, and sometimes you even get halfway, but then maybe they take the wrong step. Maybe they get distracted. But what happens is they hit the wrong pressure point, and then they come crumbling down. And I started thinking, is this not what some of our lives look like when it comes to our walk with the Lord? Some of us even, you know, here's, here's the reality that sometimes you can even grow up in church. You can even grow up, and, and you've learned different things about God at certain points in your life, and you start walking, and it seems like it's good, but then pressure hits your life. Anybody here have pressure that hits their lives sometimes, like on a consistent basis? Like it's just, we used to say something like, you know what, to kids, when you grow up, then the real world is going to hit you. You guys ever heard that? But you know what? Kids don't have to wait for them to grow up before the real world hits some of them. And the pressures come and hit, and what happens is that just as you see people who are crashing on these milk crates, and while that's painful, it's even more dangerous when you see people who are crashing in their faith. And so I want to talk about what does it look like for our lives to be built on something that doesn't come crashing down when pressure hits, when temptation hits, when distractions come, but something that's able to hold us up, the whole weight of all we are, 220 pounds of all the pressure. What's strong enough to hold up? And we're going to, look, we're going to answer that question today by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to look in verses 1 through 10 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I typically will read from the New American Standard, but today I'm going to be reading from the NIV, New International Version, just because I think it might be a little bit easier with the wording for people to, to follow along with me. So turn to your Bibles or to your phones, or you can look on the screens, and we're going to be looking in verses 1 through 10. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. Verse 3. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I love that verse 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, I'm going to entitle this message today, Built by Grace. Because a life that is well built is a life overflowing with the grace of God. If we build our lives on anything else beyond God's grace, we might even get all the way to what we consider to be the top of the ladder. But eventually, whether it's in this life or the next, it'll come crashing down. Built by grace. Let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that we've been able to behold and be a part of today. Lord, I pray, God, that today, Lord, we will examine what we have built our lives on. I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, today is October 31st, so outside of it being Next Gen Sunday, you know, what, what makes a day really special? October 31st. See, I knew it. You guys were right, right? 
October 31st is the 504th anniversary of the launch of the Reformation on October 31st. I know you guys were all probably thinking that, right? October 31st, 1517, there is this German monk named Martin Luther. Martin Luther actually, he, he tacked onto the doors of a church in Wittenberg. Everybody say that three times, Wittenberg. And it was called the 95 Thesis. And what this was, it was di different arguments against some of the problems that was arising in the church during that time. They had the selling of indulgences, which was the idea that you can kind of purchase your forgiveness or someone else's forgiveness. There are a lot of other issues that were going on in the church. And so he said, you know what, we've got to do something about this. So what he ends up doing is he ends up tacking these 95 theses on a wall. And many people say that is kind of like the kickstart of what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. That word Protestant comes from the word protest. They were protesting some of the things that were going on in the church during the time. Now, there's a lot of things that I can say about the Protestant Reformation and, uh, and a lot of things that we can say about Martin Luther. Most of it good. But, but, but here's one of the things that this caused people to have to do. They had to question at the very core what it is that they believe about the gospel. See, one of the things we have to ask ourselves when, when all is said and done when all the preaching is done, when all the music is done, what is it that you really believe about the gospel? Paul said this, he said, I have passed on to you what I have received. And so what he was saying is, he's saying, listen, I want you to understand that I have not created this. This is something that has been handed down that is of utmost, it says, first importance. This is of primary importance here. And then in verses 3 and 4, he begins to tell what the gospel really is in a summary format. He said that Christ died, died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. That seems fairly simple, right? Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was raised. Can we say that together? Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was raised. When you look in verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is what he is saying. The idea that Jesus Christ died for our sins, it lets us know that Jesus didn't just die like any other man died. There's a lot of great people that died for a lot of great causes. But what makes Jesus unique is that he didn't just, first of all, it says in John that he actually laid his life down. But then secondly, we understand that he died for us, but he not only died for us, but he died as us. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. You know what a wage is? A wage is something that you deserve. You go to your job and they give you your, your, your check. You don't look and say, well, hey, thank you so much for being considerate. You say, thank you for my money. Why? Because you say, that's what I deserve. And what the Bible teaches us in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, what we deserve. And so Jesus dying on the cross for us, he's dying for our sins. There is a debt that you are unable to pay that Christ was willing to pay. But not only that, but he not only died for us, but he died as us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which means that he became like us so that we could become like him. And so it doesn't just say that he died for our sins, but then it says that he was buried. When we had the, the baptism here, what did we do? We dunked him, we immersed him in the water. And when he was immersed in the water, that is him identifying with the burial of Jesus Christ. What type of things do you bury? Things that have died. And so when we get baptized, we're identifying with the fact that we have died to our, own, our old lives and we are buried now in baptism. But like I said earlier, we don't hold people under the water. Some of you are thankful for that if you've ever been baptized here that we don't just kind of dip you in and say, like, you know, well, that's it. When you come back up, it is a picture of the new life. And he said he had been raised on the third day. The resurrection is what we call it. Resurrection is so important that later on in the same chapter, here's what Paul says. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, everything that you believe is in vain. Me up here preaching is in vain. And so he's helping them to understand this is the core of what we believe that, what is it, that Christ died, Christ was buried, 
Christ rose. This is what he's preaching. But he doesn't just tell us what to believe. He goes and begins to tell us why we should believe it. When we get to verse 5, he talks about all the people that saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. He says Cephas. Cephas is Peter, if you're familiar with um, the Gospels. Peter, and then the rest of the 12, and then to over 500 people at the same time. Have you ever wondered, man, if God wanted everyone to believe, why doesn't he just show up to a whole bunch of people at once? Because if he just showed up to a bunch of people at once, then guess what? Nobody would have any questions about it. Everybody would know that this is real, and they would believe. But guess what he did? He appeared to over 500 people at one time. And when Paul is preaching this, he's preaching it to the very people that could have disproved it very easily. Do you know Christianity was birthed in the very place that it was been the easiest to disprove? It would have been easy because all they had to do was say, no, that wasn't Jesus, that was Tim. No, that that wasn't him. But there were people who actually saw that. Why is it important for us to believe that? Because you will never sell out for a gospel that you're not convinced of. If the Bible is once upon a time in a land far, far away, you might be entertained by that, but you're not going to sell out your life for that. And so what he's helping them to understand is that this Jesus who's been raised from the dead, you know what, this is why we know that we can put the weight of our lives on this because it's not a fair, you see how I just stopped right there, right? Uh, Because we know that at the end of the day, it is not a fairy tale. It is not make-believe. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that he has been raised from the dead. And that is the confidence that we have that what I believe in has substance to it. So Paul said this. And then he talked about how Jesus appeared to James, his brother, and to, um, and to the apostles. And then verse 8, he says, then to one untimely born, or one abnormally born, meaning that Paul came after the original apostles, and he's letting them know, Jesus even appeared to me. He's not just telling you something that he heard. He's telling them something that he experienced himself. You know it's powerful when you're actually explaining not just what you've heard or learned in Sunday school, but what you've experienced yourself. So they knew what it was like for, he he knew what it was like for Jesus to call him. And and, and so when Jesus called his life, he experienced that grace that was over his life. And so this is what we see here with with Paul preaching. And then we get to verse 9. And here's what he says in verse 9. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. An apostle was one of the leaders in the church. They were sent to go and start the work of the Lord in different places. He says, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, this isn't Paul having false humility. This was Paul being honest about his life. He's letting them know, I don't even deserve this. Some of your translations will say, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 9, what you see is a story where Paul was on his way. He was at that time referred to as Saul. He was on his way to Damascus. He wasn't there to go to a church conference, by the way. He was there to persecute Christians, put them in prison. And so he's headed there to to go and persecute them, and he had an encounter with Jesus. How many of you guys know you encounter Jesus, everything changes? He had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life. And then when he had that encounter, he began to live differently for the rest of his life. And so he is saying here in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle. I don't even deserve that. Some of us can relate to that a little bit more than we care to admit. I'm sure there might be a couple of us that might say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm a Christian because I'm pretty, I'm pretty dope. But most of us, if we look at it, we would probably say, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I'm not worthy. Now, you should have gotten a little piece of paper when you came in here. And I'm going to have you do an exercise. I don't always do this, but I thought next gen, why not? You guys see that little piece of paper? Now, here's what I want you to write down. I am not worthy because dot, dot, dot. And I want you to fill in the blank. What are some of the things that make make you feel like you're not worthy? to receive God's grace and to receive God's love. Maybe you would say, you know what, I don't know as much of the Bible as this person over here. Maybe some of you would say, you know what, I don't feel worthy because I know that I've done some stuff in my past. You know, all of us have a history. All of us have a past. 
And so some of us may say, well, I don't feel worthy because, you know what, I don't look like this person or I don't look like that person or because I'm not as smart as this person over here or maybe I don't feel worthy because I didn't grow up in the right neighborhood. But I want you to to be honest with yourself for a moment and I want you to write down all the things that you would possibly fill that blank in with. I'm not worthy because... See, some of us maybe don't have any problem with that. But I would dare imagine that some of us probably do. In fact, I know what it's like to be in an environment like this where everybody's worshiping and everybody seems like they're excited about God and feel like I'm hearing the subtle voice in my ear telling me, you don't deserve to be here. I know who you really are. Oh, that voice only talks to me. Okay, well, that's good. Sometimes you hear that voice. God can't use you to do that. Why would he use you to start sharing your faith with your coworker or with your friends or with your classmates? Why, why would God use you to begin to sing for him or to do something for his glory? Why would God use you to start that business? You're not worthy. He knows who you really are. Have you ever had that voice? But thank God for verse 10. Can everybody say, thank God for verse 10? Thank God for verse 10. Because here's what 10 starts off by saying. It says, but... By the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, when we talk about God's grace, there's an acronym that I like to use for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's when God gives us that which we don't deserve. People call it unmerited favor. Undeserved, unearned. Remember I talk about the wages of sin is death. But there's another part to verse 23, but it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know what a gift is? A gift is something that you didn't deserve. And so that's what grace is. Grace is God's gift to us. And we have been given God's grace as a gift for us. So whatever it is that you had written down, and I don't know, any of you guys write anything down that you've ever struggled with in your life? All right, so the two of us. So, um, so we, I, I feel you, right? We all have reasons why I am not worthy because whatever that blank was, whatever that thing was that you put down, here's what I want you to write over top of it in all caps, if you can write in all caps. Grace. Grace. You know what grace tells us? Is that grace gives to us, not based on our performance, not based on how good we have been, not based on how well I preach or how well they sing or how well we do anything else, but God gives us his grace because God is gracious, because of his son, Jesus Christ. And so Paul understood what it was to be a recipient of this grace. And his life was built now, not on what he was able to do. If you read Philippians chapter 3, he had a resume of all the great things that he did. But all those things he said was like garbage in comparison to knowing the beauty of Christ. But God gave him grace and Paul received that grace, but that grace wasn't just a sense of him saying, you know what, I'm so glad I got the grace of God. Now I can continue to live however I want to live. I heard somebody say, that's not grace, that's grease. I just kind of slide into the church and I slide into the world. You know, that's... I don't know where that came. But what God does give us is grace. When Paul received that grace, listen to what he said in verse 10. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So you know what he understood? Here's what Paul understood. He understood that everything that he did was by the grace of God. So now he built his life on understanding that it was God's grace. You build it on what you think you've accomplished, you'll live a life of pride. Or you'll live a life of just self-flagellation, saying, I just don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve. No, no, no. He understood what God has done, and now he took that grace, and he wanted to use that grace to be used to do something for God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. In verse 8, it lets us know that we've been saved by grace through faith. It's not by work so that no one can boast. It is the gift of God. We go over to verse 9, and it says, um, we go over to verse 10, and it goes when it says this. It says, for we are God's handiwork. 
We are his handiwork or his workmanship created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has created you to do something great. And it's by his grace that we're able to walk in it. It's by his grace that we're able to do the things that God has called us to do. But here's the thing. If we've never received his grace, we'll continue living and building our lives on a foundation that's going to fall. You know, we sang a song earlier about walking on water. And, and what you saw, you saw, you know, they, they were dancing, they were doing their moves. I'm not going to show off right now on my dance moves. But as they were doing this walk on water, I was thinking about the story that this is in reference to. And that story points back to a time where Jesus was walking on the water in the middle of a storm. The disciples were in a boat. And if you could imagine how you would feel if you were in a boat and you saw Jesus walking on water, you wouldn't be dancing. You'd probably be thinking, what in the world is going on? They were intimidated. But Jesus lets them know, listen, it is, it's me. It's me. And you know what Peter says? He says, Lord, if this is you, then bid me to come. Jesus said, come on. Peter steps out of the water. He began walking towards Jesus until something happened. You know what began to happen? So he began to look at the waves, and he began to look at all the stuff that was going on around him. And then he began to sink. Jesus helps him, but he says, why did you doubt? And I started thinking, is this not what some of our lives look like? It's like we start walking with Jesus. We start off by grace. We start off just grateful for what God has done, but somewhere along the way, we stop building the way that God has called us to build and we start relying on ourselves. We thought it was our strength that was holding us up. We thought it was our grace that was keeping us. I'll apologize to him later, but I'm gonna share this story for probably like the 20th time here. But it just reminds me, when I think about, you know, uh, years ago, Elijah, wherever you are, I'm sorry, I gotta use this story. But, you know, he used to hate wearing a life vest. He hated it. Every time we would try to put a life vest on him, he would fight us. And I had one of those days where I was just tired of fighting. Some of you parents might know what that's like, but you just have one of those days where you're like, I just don't feel like fighting today. If you don't want to wear a life vest, don't wear a life vest. And so I did what any good parent would do. I let him jump in. <laughs> and while he's there, he, his eyes got real big. He starts fighting. Sorry, Elijah, this is for you. And he starts fighting and fighting. He can swim really well now, by the way. But at that time, he couldn't. And I just let it go for just a second. Then I pulled him up out of that water. I looked him in his little eyes. And I said, are you ready to put a life vest on now? And you know what? I didn't have to fight him anymore about putting that life vest on. But you know what? In his mind, he thought it was his own power that was keeping him up. He thought it was his own strength that was keeping him afloat. And I want to let you know today, some of us have been thinking that we've been able to do this on our own strength. We've been living as if it's been our own smart intelligence. It's been our own work ethic. It's been our own uh, prowess. It's been our connections that's been keeping us up. And I want to let you know, it's not the, any of that that's been able to hold you up. It's the grace of God. It is God's grace that has been keeping us. It is God's grace that has been keeping us. And I feel like God is saying for some of us, it's like he's looking us in the eyes because you've been trying on your own strength to build your life on your own power. And he's looking you in the eyes right now and he's asking you, are you ready to try grace now? Are you ready to really trust in me now? Are you still trying to build your life on your own strength now? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. How do we receive that grace? I'm so glad you asked that. Because in Ephesians 2.8, he says this. We are saved by grace through faith. As we place our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are able to experience his grace. I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. I thank you, God that it is your grace that has called us out of darkness 
Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the grace, Lord, when we've thought that it's our own strength holding us up, when we've acted as if we've been able to do this on our own. God, it's your grace that has kept us. So help us to live lives that are built by your grace. You know, before I close, I just want to pray. I don't know everybody in this room on a personal basis. But perhaps you look at your life and you realize that you've been living on your own strength. You may have prayed prayers when you were young. You may have grown up knowing certain Bible verses, or maybe not. Maybe you didn't grow up in church at all. But you realize that what you've been building your life on is not able to sustain you. And you need the grace of God in your life to save you so that you can live the life that God has called you to live. If that's you, I want you to just, as a way, I'm not going to ask you to come up front or stand up or turn around and do hoops or anything like that. But I want you to be honest with God and more so honest with yourself. If you're saying, God, you know what, that's me. God, I need your grace. As we're in this attitude of prayer, I just want to pray for you. Let's just pray right now. If that's you, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray, first of all, that you would forgive us for times that we thought that we could do this on our own strength. For saying, I got it, God. I got it from here. I'll take it from here, God. God, forgive us for that. I'm asking, Lord, that you would give us the ability to trust you more. I pray that you would give us the ability to not live based on the condemnation of our past, but God, that we would live on the conviction of what you've done on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for our sins, that you were buried and that you were raised back up to life. And I'm asking, Lord, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead to live on the inside of us, live on the inside of me, that I might live different and live a life built by grace. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, can we all say together, amen.